Okay, one of the most important things to think of any time you're doing anything in law, or as a matter of fact, if you're writing a letter to your kid, um, the most important words are the tiniest words. They're the words of position, if you will. They're in, at, on, of, um, for, um, above, on, you know, things about position. All right? What things happen, you know, okay? And all those little words are very, very important. For example, if I am standing on your foot, I'm trespassing. If I'm standing in your foot, I've committed a miracle, and I've been able to actually move my foot inside your body. If I'm standing at your foot, I am decided, okay? If I am standing over your foot, I might be considered a threat. If I'm standing under your foot, you have some control over me, and you might be hurting me. The words, the very small words, are very, very important to keep in mind. And so stop using the word in when it comes to anything in law, all right? At, on, around, near are all great, okay? You can be filing this in your court, and you can use the word there and then, if you name your court, right? You can name your court in your filing. I'm filing this in the court of, you know, Granny at, you know, the district county courthouse. And so that they know, that you know, that you're not in their court system. Okay, now the only other thing that you can be in besides a cup or a container is the word agreement. You and I can be in agreement. Okay, that means we can be in a state of something. All right, we can be in disagreement. We can be in heaven. We can be in, you know, some form of state of being. Okay, and believe it or not, they will use all these tiny little words to help you move yourself out of your jurisdiction and place yourself squarely into their jurisdiction. So you have to be extremely careful, all right? So I don't know if that helps. I'll stop there because I think you get the general idea of what I'm talking about. Um, yeah. Make sure you understand the words you're using. Hey, Greg. Hey, Greg. I Great. Yes. Just answer that. Just answer that question because a lot of people ask that too. What's the difference between in law and law? In law <laughs> is in the state of law. Okay. At law is juxtaposed to it. You you, you want to explain it to John? To John from Colorado is asking that question. He says what? You know, so I want to be at law or I want to be in law when I write my paper. In law. Because he's asking, he said, what about filing at law? Is filing at law good or bad? Filing at law is what attorneys have to do. Because they're operating in their fictional capacity as a steward. Okay. Well, I'd, I'd like to add in there, say, like I'm operating in law because who creates the law? I do. So, uh, right. Create of all my laws. I'm not waiting for a man to put a piece of paper in front of me and say, now there's your laws, call, obey them, and live the rest of your life according to these laws that I wrote for you. What? I'm not, I'm not, this is my turn in the sunshine. I don't care what somebody in 1776 told me I'm supposed to do. F them. This is my turn to do what I want. I'm going to create my laws. I'm going to create what I think is necessary and proper for my constant survival, and what I think is beneficial or not beneficial, and I'll accept benefits and I won't accept certain benefits. They're gifts, gifts from my forefathers to me, whether I accept them or not. That's no concern to anybody else who's uh, the trustee. Don't you worry about it. You just hand out the, uh, the assets that uh, the, the trustor or the forefathers created for me. So any damn concern that you're holding me obligated to a gift. You can't hold me obligated to a gift. Just because I'm a beneficiary of Social Security or, or, or whatever other acts of whatever doesn't mean I'm obligated to uh, compensate for the gift. Well, why would why he establish this gift for me? If it was an obligation, then it's not a gift. Well, I think so, Spooner put extremely well because he even uses that to describe the original founders of the United States. He says there's, no, there's nothing in law that allows for a parent or a predecessor. Well, this, 
their children or anybody else. In other words, if, if you are a dad and you build a house and you give it to your kids and say, I built this house for our family and you have to use it for the rest of our family's life, for on and on for eternity. Well, your son can accept that gift and say, well, thanks, Dad. He can also say, sell it. I don't like that house. I don't need it. And there's nothing that you can do to make your kids keep that house, take that house, live in that house. Right. Because like I said, I think John was typing too slow because it says, so at-law and in-law means no difference then. No, we just explained to you what it means. So you can re-listen to this tape again, but it's really simple. Attorneys are at-law. We are in-law. We are the law. Right, but there's also a reason that hundreds and hundreds of years ago, they came up with the term to describe your wife's mother as your mother-in-law, not your mother-at-law. Okay? Because you and your wife created law by contract. Right? By your marriage. And so your mother is your, her mother becomes your mother-in-law, which means in the law of the marriage contract. That's what it means. It's within. It's embraced. You can understand that. It's when man creates his own law, man creates law, you're in law, and compared to at law, the attorneys could only approach the law. They're not actually in the law. That's why they don't testify. They have no firsthand knowledge. It kind of makes sense. They're not witness to the law because they weren't there. Okay, hopefully that helps. I don't remember. Was Granny asking anything else? Because Granny's still on the phone. Well, I just I just don't know where to uh, do the oh. uh, matter jurisdiction. Yeah, yeah, I remember the question now. Yeah, like I said, we're, we're going to do we're going to do like a, a family court thing. We'll do that. Like I said to the other lady, will you file the appeal? And well, not file appeal. Will you file the original? You find out where the judgment was. And uh, obviously, you want to make a void judgment. You could make a void judgment at that court, but like I said, they're going to basically ignore you. So you can take it to the district court, and uh, you move your court into the district court, and you're making the judgment a void judgment. And, and Greg, you explain to me, he feels like it, but a void judgment is an actual thing. It's it's not an and it's not an it doesn't describe the judgment. A void judgment is a like a specific phrase, like a specific thing. It doesn't say the judgment is void. It's a void judgment. A void judgment does never existed. Right, so, exactly. Okay. Greg, you want to do that real quick? What about what a void judgment is? Yeah, it's about the adjectives and diminishing the capacity of the noun like that, the subject in front, why, you know, you want to be careful when you say the judgment is void or it's a void judgment. Um, right. <clears throat> um, in English structure, the uh, the antecedent word... <clears throat> is the uh, predominant word, okay, and I'll try to put that in high school words. Uh, whatever word comes last is the word that's being modified. The word that comes before it is the word that's doing the modification. Uh, one thing that a lot of us that are on this cookie trail are familiar with is hearing somebody saying, oh, I've got the right to a jury trial, okay, with regards to your rights as opposed to a trial by jury. <clears throat> now, Trial by is one phrase, okay? Jury is the subject of the modification. So what you're entitled to is a jury, all right? You're entitled to a jury. And you can just say, I'm entitled to a jury. You could even skip the trial by, all right? Trial by is simply modifying that so everybody knows we're talking about having a trial by jury, not a hearing by jury, not a coffee meeting by jury, not going and shooting pull with a jury but a trial by jury, all right? Uh, and if you go the other way around and say a jury trial, you're saying, I want a trial, and I want a jury to be there, okay? It doesn't say what their role is. It doesn't say what their responsibilities are. It doesn't say that they can override a judge. It doesn't say that they're going to be making the, making the determination of law and establishing the facts. It doesn't say that. Um, it doesn't say it's a court of record. Um, so... When you move the words around, they mean completely different things because it's the last thing in the group of words that is the, the critical thing, and you can get rid of all the other modifiers and still make sense. Okay? You know, I'm going to drive my car. Okay? I'm going to drive my beat-up old 1997 Ford car. 
All right. I can get rid of all those modifiers and just I'm going to drive my car. All right. And so the more words I put in there, the more diminished my car got. All right. Even if uh, I put positive words like my brand new uh, Subaru hatchback with uh, shiny chrome wheel covers. All right. I'm still limiting my car. Every time you describe the car, you limit it. Right? When you make a list, for example, if you're going to tell a court or a judge that your claims include um, apples, oranges, pears, and bananas, okay, but well, let me do a better job. Let's say oranges, limes, and grapefruits, okay, and others. All right, so what you just did is you named three citrus foods fruits, and others. So that means that everything in your list of includes only includes citrus fruits. Even though you said oranges, limes, grapefruits, and others, you might have thought that you were talking about apples and pomegranates and bananas, but you're not because you created a list and you did it, and the word includes is a limiting word, not an inclusive word. All right? So there's a lot of things that we have to be careful of when we use words in combination with each other and when we're structuring those kinds of things because in our effort to try to be more clear to the reader, we usually end up diminishing what it is we're going to say. So be extremely careful um, to not add additional adjectives and additional adverbs whenever it's possible to just speak like a very simple sentence, like see, spot, run, I love you, you know, God is good, you know, Cubs suck at baseball, you know. Well, well, Greg, you, well Greg, I think that you did real good, but let me, uh, this, you brought up a good point there. Uh, when, when people want to avoid a judgment, see, this is why uh, I try to say to you folks, make very many separate independent orders, because like oh, say, you some some lady was saying uh, about a divorce and kids and settlement and all this other nonsense. So if she goes back in this fall back in 2004, and basically the only judgment that she's going to show me is something about divorce and all this stuff, it's going to be pretty hard for her to avoid the judgment because do you not no longer want to be divorced to this man and you want all the thing to be the judgment to like it never existed, not ab initio like from the beginning, but avoid judgment means it never existed. So you you only want to Avoid that judgment, or if you want to avoid the judgment, you're going to have to start from dead scratch. And that's why I try to say, can you make separate orders? Can you guys just say, look, place this order so that way somewhere in the future, or if you're not granted, or something's denied, or you want to modify a certain thing, you don't have to go back and rearrange the whole thing from the beginning. You can just say, look, I, you know, let's do this a la carte. Let me make an order, separate checks, separate claims, separate bills, just in case, you know what? You make this great big huge order for this waitress, and the waitress says, I can't grant you that order. So you say, I want pineapples, fruit, uh, a shrimp cocktail, uh, uh, flounder, uh, moose oxtail, soup, uh, uh, you know, can we have kippers? You know, it's breakfast. And the lady said, I can't grant that order. And she said, why not? It's like, look, I ain't got time to explain it. I can't grant that order. I'm out of here. So if he says, can I have kid this approach? Yes. Okay. Can I have oxtail? Yes. Can I have shrimp? Yes. Can I have shrimp scampi? Yes. Can I have a, a fruit cocktail? No. Why? Because we don't have it. We don't have the capacity to deliver that to you. But everything else we can give you. But that we can't do. So instead of the, the judges are going to explain to you exactly why you can't have every damn thing on that you just ordered. He's busy. He ain't got time. Maybe he couldn't care less. And honestly, it's not his job. So that's why I say to you folks, you know, when you, when, like I said, when you find these judgments, when you avoid the judgment, if you if you put so many times, if you make this judgment so freaking long, it's gonna, it, it, you're gonna have to go all the way back to the beginning, start all over again, and just go back to the divorce because that's what happened with my with my sister and her ex-husband. The judge said, you know what, the original order to consent decree is is a disaster. You know what, he didn't disclose that he was hiding assets. So we're going to have to start this whole divorce all over from the beginning. And my sister said, oh, no way. I'm not going through this again. So see what I'm trying to say to you folks? When, when, when you say, okay, when you have the judge write up the order, or, well, you propose the order to the judge if you want to, if you're going through like, a divorce, if you really trust the person in a black role, you have attorneys, you propose the orders, and then the, the attorney sends the proposals to both sides and the judge and everybody 
kumbayas and, you know, comes up with a decision. When you're a man in common law, you create the orders. You're not waiting for the judge. And he's, he's just we're sitting there waiting for you. He's like, okay, when are you going to place your order with me? It's like going into McDonald's to the drive-thru. It's like, oh, and the lady in the window, you tell me what I want. Go ahead. You make the order for me. Like, what are you kidding? Tell me, buddy. What do you want? Oh, I want a happy meal and some fries. Okay, that's what I had to say. Give me number two. Okay, here's your order. Fine. That's what a judge wants to do. Just give me your order, and I'll give it to the court clerk, and the court clerk will stamp it that I witnessed that nobody answered. Nobody objected to your order. I delivered your order. Now go out and do whatever you want with it. Throw it on your windshield. Eat it. Do whatever you want. It's your order. Go bring it down to the sheriff's department. Hang it on your wall. We don't care. You got your judgment? Great. I, oh, I also like, in common law, Carl, I also like to really start not calling these guys judges, but calling them magistrate and then putting the word judge in four corner brackets. Because that's they like to call, because that's what they know, but I'm not asking them to operate in the capacity of a judge. I'm asking them to operate as a public magistrate. Okay? Right. That's what right. I'm asking them to do. All right, as somebody who's just been assigned from the court clerk's office to witness the procedure, that's all. Stay in the background, stay out of the loop. We don't need you. We got the tribunal here, we got the jury, we got the other sides, we're good to go. Just say that you witnessed this event. And then just take the rendering from the jury, take the verdict, bring it to the district court clerk's, take it to the court clerk's office, let her stamp it, and say that, you know, you witnessed this went down, and this is the true verdict from the jury. This is the true bill they handed down, and this is what all parties are supposed to get and forever holding peace. No appeals, nothing, we're done. 